Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Thank you very much for joining us for the first in a, a series of webinars on planning for sustainable financing, um, which is to prepare everybody for pandemic prevention, preparedness and readiness and resilience. This will be a several uh, part webinar series for the pandemic fund round two um, pr preparation process. So today we're gonna focus today's session on introduction to sustainable financing. We have four presenters with us today, uh, Dr. Scott uh, Pendergast from WHO. Uh, we can go ahead and change slides. Who's the Director of Strategic Planning and Partnership. Uh, he'll be followed by two colleagues from the Pandemic Fund, Priya Basu, who's the Executive Head, and Catherine uh, Hugo, uh, Huganat from who's the health specialist for the Pandemic Fund Secretariat. We'll follow this from um, some stories from the field where we'll hear from Ashalu um, Abuna, Abaina uh, to talk about um, the experience of the Pandemic Fund preparedness from round one from uh, Ethiopia's context. So I'd like to invite you throughout today's session to please um, ask any questions that you may have, not by raising your hand, but rather putting it in the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. We'll be collecting the questions and answers or questions, and then the ones that we're not able to answer today, we will pull together into a frequently asked question list and we'll be sending sharing that out following today's session. In addition to the uh, questions and answers, we'll also be providing the recording of the session as well as any other tools um, and resources that we'll share today. So with that, I'll turn it over to Scott Pendergast to launch with uh, the background of the series and the goal for today. Thank you. Thanks, Mindy, and thanks everybody for joining today. Um, it's a really, really uh, important thing for us that we're able to reach out to everybody and provide information and support um, as you're working at country level, um, going through how to get sustainable financing for preparedness. Uh, we did do a first round of this uh, training course last year for the first round of the pandemic fund. And um, for all of us coming back, I'm sure we've learned a lot of lessons and uh, a lot of improvements that hopefully we can make as we go into this second round. Uh, a little bit of a background is on sort of sustainable finance and preparedness is as we've come out of COVID, um, there was a number of big recommendations uh, in the global community around how can we be better prepared for the next pandemic. Um, and there's a lot of work that's going on currently in three key areas around governance, around financing and around systems. Um, on governance, uh, there's currently the negotiation going on around the pandemic agreement and updates to the international health regulations. There was also the UN high-level meeting on pandemic preparedness last year where many, many, actually nearly all heads of state um, made strong commitments towards being prepared and better prepared in the future. Um, on the financing side, uh, we did a piece of work with the World Bank and the Joint Finance and Health Task Force of the G20 a couple of years ago, looking at what were the major sort of needs and gaps in the areas of pandemic preparedness. And at that point, we sort of had high level estimates of around about a $30 billion per annum need and about a 10 to $12 billion per annum gap. And so there is a significant gap on the amount of investment that's currently going into um, pandemic preparedness that we're trying to fill. And one of the outcomes of that was actually the setup of the pandemic fund um, and bringing additional financing into this preparedness area. Uh, and currently, and, and uh, Priya and Catherine will go into more detail, the, the pandemic fund is currently capitalized at around, around about 2 billion. We went through the first round of proposals last year and there was a, a, an award of about 330 million and now in the second round of uh, proposal development for this year, uh, we're looking, they're looking at a, an additional award of around about 500 million being available. But beyond just the pandemic fund, it's really critical that we're able to sort of broaden the number of uh, financing streams that we're able to bring, it, bring into preparedness. Because clearly the amount of funding in the pandemic fund is not going to be enough 
And the design of the pandemic fund was that it was really meant to be a catalytic financing resource in order to be able to ca catalyze additional financing. And so here, uh, we and the other implementing entities have been working very closely together um, to try and work out how can we take the pandemic fund grant proposals, which were very strong last year, but further leverage them, um, in particular looking at the international financial financing institutions, such as the multilateral development banks. So as countries go through this round of proposals this year, looking at their previous proposal, looking at the TAP, rec TAP recommendations on how they can improve them, we're also strongly trying to get better coordination and more financing into those proposals uh, coming through different investment sources. Um, so one of the big things that we want to make sure in this series of um, training is that we're able to go through the existing assessment processes on, under the IHR, looking at the national priorities, being able to cost them, but most importantly, being able to bring additional financing into financing those plans. Uh, and that will really be a focus of, of, of the, um, the series as we go forward. And so with that, I'll pass back to uh, Mindy uh, to introduce the next speaker. Thank you. Great, thanks, Scott. Yes, I didn't introduce myself earlier. My name is uh, Melinda Frost. Everybody, as you can hear, calls me Mindy, and I'm the unit head for learning solutions and training within the health emergencies program at WHO. So happy to welcome everybody today. Thank you, Scott. And I'll be turning it over to our colleagues from the Pandemic Fund. First, we'll hear from Priya Basu, Executive Head for the Pandemic Fund Secretariat. Priya? And also, just as a quick reminder, please, if you have any questions, please use the Q&A function of the Zoom at the bottom of your screen. Thank you. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Oh, great. Okay. Wonderful. Well, um, hello, everyone, and uh, great to join you today um, on this webinar. Uh, I'll, I'll quickly um, give you a bit of a background on the pandemic fund and uh, and also um, a little bit about uh, what we've achieved in our uh, first 18 months and then I'll hand over to my colleague uh, Catherine to walk you through the details of the second call uh, for proposals. So I just wanted to very quickly um, share with you that the pandemic fund uh, was created um, uh, formally established uh, in September 2022 on the heels of the COVID-19 pandemic uh, in recognition of the fact that there was no uh, dedicated financing mechanism uh, to support pandemic uh, prevention, uh, preparedness and response uh, investments in low and middle income countries. Uh, it, uh, it was uh, put together under the leadership of the G20 uh, and uh, the World Bank and the WHO worked together very closely uh, to, to design this fund and um, you know, get it uh, up and running. Uh, next slide, please. In in a very short period of time, we were able to mobilize uh, over two billion dollars uh, from twenty seven donors, and uh, the uh, the key uh, value uh, proposition or value added uh, of the pandemic fund um, uh, includes its ability to mobilize funding from non uh, ODA sources. Uh, the fact that uh, it's uh, uh, it's designed in a way that uh, the uh, the financing, the grant financing that the pandemic fund provides seeks to uh, mobilize uh, resources both from uh, external partners as well as incentivize countries themselves to uh, increase their investments uh, in, in pandemic PPR. It seeks to promote coordination uh, and collaboration across the, uh, the many actors in uh, the global health financing space, as well as uh, domestically uh, across various arms of government. Uh, it has the flexibility to uh, work through a variety of institutions. So it doesn't actually make direct investments. It always works with uh, a group of uh, accredited uh, implementing entities that include the WHO, the World Bank, uh, uh, various multilateral development banks, other UN agencies like uh, FAO and UNICEF, as well as Global Fund, Gavi and CEPI. Um, and uh, it, uh, it, as I mentioned, uh, really seeks to, to increase efforts by the countries themselves, uh, low and middle income countries. Uh, next slide, please. 
Uh, so three points about its, uh, uh, its governance uh, model. Uh, it's based on, uh, the governance is based on a balanced representation of uh, uh, what we call uh, contributors, uh, what we call co-investors, which are the developing countries that are uh, eligible to receive funds from the pandemic fund. Uh, so we have nine seats for contributors and then nine seats for co-investors. You see uh, the co-investor countries uh, in, in, in the middle box here with each, each country representing uh, a large constituency uh, of developing countries. Uh, and then we have two seats for civil society and one for non-sovereign contributors. I already mentioned the point around flexibility. I also want to emphasize transparency and accountability uh, are, are key um, uh, focus uh, areas for the uh, for the pandemic fund. Uh, next slide, please. So, in terms of its scope, uh, right in the middle, you see that uh, uh, the um, uh, the uh, uh, strengthening of capacity at country uh, and uh, local levels is uh, front and center. Uh, this is uh, this is capacity in areas like uh, disease surveillance, early warning systems, laboratories, uh, health workforce, uh, and so on. Uh, on the left hand side, you see that we also have a focus on building regional and global capacities across uh, a range of areas to fill gaps in uh, pandemic uh, prevention, preparedness, and response. And then on the right side, uh, support to technical uh, supporting technical assistance. Uh, building capacities through TA as well as learning and convening uh, being uh, being important uh, areas for the pandemic fund. Next slide, please. So um, five priority areas um, were identified again uh, in terms of the scope of the pandemic fund in uh, close uh, consultation and collaboration with the WHO. Uh, and these uh, are disease surveillance, community engagement, uh, public uh, health, uh, social measures, and so forth, uh, laboratories, um, uh, health workforce, uh, and then emergency communications, coordination, and management. Next slide, please. This is just a quick snapshot of just how much we've achieved in in the uh, in the first eighteen months. It's it's really been a sprint. Uh, we'll, we'll share these slides with you later, so uh, so have a look. But, uh, you know, it was um, in the first instance, it was really establishing the fund, getting its governance right, its operating arrangements, uh, then moving on very quickly uh, to um, launching the first call for proposals of the pandemic fund, which was uh, launched in, uh, um, in, in Towards the end of uh, 2022, uh, uh, we launched um, uh, a kind of um, uh, expression of interest process, actually early 2023. Uh, and then uh, the formal uh, first call for proposals was, was awarded in, uh, in, um, in July 2023. And then we moved forward very quickly with designing the second call for proposals, which uh, very much drew on lessons that we had learned from the first call and um, uh, you know, trying to to make sure that um, uh, there's as many of those lessons were incorporated into the design and implementation arrangements uh, of of the second call. Next slide, please. So let me just give you very quickly an overview of the first call. So the first call for proposals was uh, uh, was as I said uh, launched uh, last year. Uh, and uh, awarded in the summer, 19, 19 projects were uh, were selected out of uh, a very large number of uh, uh, projects that uh, uh, that submitted proposals. Uh, these nineteen projects represent thirty seven low and middle income countries. Uh, a total amount of three hundred and thirty eight million dollars was uh, was awarded in grant funding uh, to um, uh, to mobilize actually around 2 billion in additional resources from uh from from uh, from um, external financiers as well as uh, from the countries themselves um these projects important to to note that uh they uh, they they focus uh, uh, a very large number of them uh, include a focus on one health 
uh, as well as I, if I recall correctly, I think 17 out of the 19 projects focus on AMR surveillance uh, as a part of the uh, the um, uh, the work that they are doing, uh, and uh, the um, uh, the the overall scope of this uh, of this first call uh, was uh, disease surveillance labs and uh, human resources, uh, and 75% uh, of the grants from this first call uh, went to low income and lower middle income countries. The majority of these projects represent collaboration across one or more of uh, the implementing entities uh, that I spoke about earlier. So really bringing together coordination across external partners. And again, the majority of these projects bring together uh, coordination across uh, partners at the domestic level as well, various arms of government. Next slide, please. Um, so uh, these are just some examples of how the projects uh, that the Pandemic Fund has supported under its first call for proposals um, promote uh, uh, coordination uh, across actors in in the PPR space, uh, and uh, you know play a catalytic role, uh, ensuring that every dollar of grant financing that the pandemic fund provides actually um, brings more money uh, through uh, uh, through um, uh, to its to the leverage role that the pandemic fund plays uh, brings more money for. Uh, uh, the 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 countries that 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 we're supporting. Uh, so uh, there was uh, you know three three projects worth highlighting are uh, a, a project in in Ethiopia, uh, a project in in India, and then um, a uh, a cross country project in in the Caribbean. Uh, the the project in Ethiopia, as you see here, um, it's uh, it's it's a multi sectoral project brings together. Uh, many arms of the government of Ethiopia together, Ministry of Health, uh, Ministry of Environment, Agriculture, uh, Natural Resources, and so on, around a One Health approach. And at the international level, it brings together uh, the WHO, FAO, UNICEF, and, uh, uh, and partners to work together to really strengthen Ethiopia's capacity for early detection, uh, for surveillance uh, labs, connecting uh, uh, animal uh, health labs with 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 human labs, um, and then uh, health workforce, but also beyond health workforce, uh, uh, you know, kind of um, strengthening um, uh, veterinarian uh, and uh, other sort of animal uh, health workers. Uh, and then in uh, similarly the the India project, the One Health project, bringing together the World Bank, Asian Development Bank, and so on, and uh, various arms of government together. And then in the Caribbean, it's a project with the Inter American Development Bank and CARFA, the Caribbean Public Health Agency. So this is just to give you a snapshot of uh, what we've achieved, uh, and uh, you know these projects are all rolling out now, and so it's really exciting to see how uh, they are embodying the um the, uh, uh, the 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 key principles of the pandemic fund uh to um uh, to help support these uh, these countries and regions in becoming better prepared uh for uh, the next pandemic uh so let me now hand over to Catherine to walk you through the uh, main elements of the second call for for proposals which we just launched uh, uh, last month Catherine Thank you, Priya. Um, as Scott mentioned, the envelope for this call for proposal is larger. Um, we have an envelope of 500 million. It prioritizes um, investments under the same three priority areas as the first call for proposals. So that would be early warning um, and disease surveillance systems, laboratory systems, and human resources and public health and community workforce, workforce capacity. And this is across both human and animal health. Um, as a cross-cutting area, um, you can see at the bottom of this slide, um, we talk about how across all three of these um, areas, community engagement and gender and equity considerations will be really important for you to show um, how you're approaching these um, within your proposal development and also um, implementation of the project. Very quickly, as Priya said, we'll we'll share these slides. Just a few a, a few key um, parameters to keep uh, in mind, and things that are different about this call for proposal. Uh, in terms of eligibility, um, like last time, countries that are able to receive funding from IBRD um, or IDA are eligible to apply. However, in terms of the single country grants, to make sure that we give an opportunity 
to other countries, um, the 16 countries that receive single country grants under the first call for proposals will not be eligible to apply for single country grants under the second. But this is just for the second call for proposal. It doesn't mean in the future they wouldn't be eligible. But just for this particular call, those 16 countries cannot apply for a single country grant. However, they may apply um, under a, a multi-country proposal. In terms of the envelope, I already mentioned it's um, 500 million. Uh, we've now put caps on uh, the amount of funding that may be requested. So single country proposals may request up to 25 million and multi-country and regional entity proposals may request up to $40 million. In terms of the types of proposals, sorry, go, <laughs> thank you. In terms of the types of proposals, um, we have the same three types as the last round. So single country, multi-country, and regional entity proposal. A regional entity proposal is where one regional entity and one or more implementing entities um, make a, a submit a proposal together. And then on the submission limits, the one thing that um, I would like to mention is that individual countries may only submit a maximum of one single country proposal to us in order to um, uh, participate. Next slide, please. Um, so in terms of how, how you should approach the development of the proposal, I think there are three really key things to keep in mind um, and things that we saw that were, you know, that made um, applicants successful in the last round. So we're looking for proposals that promote a coordinated, collaborative, and coherent approach to pandemic PPR. So bringing together multiple different actors um, across the spectrum of, of sectors linking financing with existing um, country or regional level planning um, with, uh, with the NAPS, uh, making sure that um, you know, there are, if there are multiple implementing entities, you're leveraging the strengths of each entity. Um, more implementing entities is a, is a good thing. It would be good to have you know, several implementing entities and several different uh, ministries working together on a single country proposal. Um, also, if you can demonstrate the catalytic effect of the grant, what this means is that we would like to see if we give you a, a grant, how much um, additional financing will be mobilized, either from um, co-financing sources, from the implementing entities, or from um, bilateral aid agencies, and how much co-investment will be will be leveraged from the actual beneficiaries, the country uh, itself, et cetera. There are no minimum requirements, but We'd like to see, you know, the more the more the better in this case. And then another thing you should keep in mind is that the proposal should ensure a consideration of equity. So you should show how you, the how the activities will promote greater gender equity, broader health equity, how civil society has been engaged in the proposal development process, and how it will be involved in implementation. These things are very important to demonstrate in your proposal. Next slide. In terms of the um, the technical evaluation, so this is the breakdown of how our technical advisory panel will evaluate the proposals. So the bulk, um, so 50% will go into sections A and B. So the scope and objectives of the proposal along with the rational demonstrated needs and alignment with national and regional priorities. 15% will go into kind of the catalytic effect, so co-financing and co-investment. 15% will be in the ownership, commitment, coordination, collaboration, and co-creation section. And then 20% will be in the actual implementation, m and &E, and alignment with um, the pandemic fund results framework section. Next slide. In terms of the timeline, um, we've opened the online application portal and the documentation. So the PDF of the application, along with the scoring and weighting methodology, are all up on our website right now. Um, applicants have until May 17th to submit their applications on the online application. Um, then the Secretariat will screen proposals for eligibility in late May and um, send eligible proposals to the TAP. The TAP will have um, June, July, and August to review, the, review each of the proposals. They may get um, through the portal they may get in contact with you if they need additional information or clarifications. And then um, they will finalize recommendations to the board, which will be shared by September 15th. 
Um, and then the board, we expect the board to make a funding decision by October. However, I should note that these timelines could be compressed um, and it could happen a bit earlier depending on how many applications are received. Next slide, please. So this is more for you when you um, when you receive these slides, but uh, you have to complete the application on our online application portal. We are not accepting any paper copies of applications. So here is the link to the portal, um, which you can access when you have this slide. And the deadline is May 17th. Next slide. And then this again is also for your information, um, where to find the guidance note how to access the electronic application portal. Um, there's also a how-to video on our website along with FAQs and we'll be releasing a help desk so you can submit questions directly to us if you're having any problems with the application. Um, I also wanted to mention that we ourselves are hosting two information sessions tomorrow, um, one at 7 a.m. Washington DC time and one at 6 p.m. Washington DC time. And you can um, find information about how to sign up on our on our website as well as on our Twitter account. And now I um, I'll pass back to you, uh, Mindy. Thank you. Great. Thanks a lot, Catherine. And thank you, Priya, for going over um, all the information from the Global Fund. And nice to know that you'll also have information sessions uh, to follow as well. So next, we're going to go to um, a country representative, Ashtolu Abaina, who will talk about his experience um, having applied for the first round, round one. I think we saw a little bit of some of the examples from Ethiopia, probably some that he was involved with applying for. So we'll go now to a country experience. Um, Ashtola, thank you and welcome. Thank you so following much. Following this, uh, we'll go to, I'll just say, following this, we'll go to some questions and answers. So if you do have any questions, please feel free to enter them in the Q&A function right now. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you so much. Good afternoon and good morning all. Uh, this is Ashtola from Ethiopia. And thank you so much for organizing such uh, important uh, uh, platform for uh, all countries to learn from each other. And uh, as Ethiopian, we are uh, very much happy to share our experience. And also, we are ready to learn from uh, from uh, colleagues, for especially for us, for uh, the second call as a multi-country and regional uh, proposal. Thank you so much. So I just want to uh, give you a very highlight, a few highlights on the, our success and uh, how to use it for your uh, uh, country proposal development. So uh, just as in introduction, the Ethiopian pandemic uh, multi-sectoral prevention and preparedness uh, response project, EPPR, uh, awarded uh, to Ethiopia under the pandemic fund. And the call for the proposal and the uh, proposal development took place in uh, April to May in 2023. So Ethiopian proposal was successful and awarded uh, the bigger amounts at 50 million USD with the co-funding 63 million USD. And uh, when the first call of the proposal was raised and the way where uh, several uh, attempts by the various government agencies, UN agencies, NGOs uh, to develop and submit uh, independent proposal, including individuals, uh, scholars, and academic institutions also participated in, in for in a, a single proposal. And then, uh, then the the call for harmonization for all independent proposal into one Ethiopian proposal led by the Minister of Health and the WHO. Uh, next slide, please. So the the concert team we developed, we established the concert team defined as like a participant from the Minister of Health and its affiliated agencies, Minister of Agriculture and its affiliated agencies, UN partners, uh, WHO, UNITEF, FAO, and uh, NGOs, Results to Save Life, uh, GOHIO, Global One Health Initiative, uh, um, and also the CHAI and the National uh, One Health Steering Committee uh, came together to develop one Ethiopian proposal. And each member of the concert team share relevant supporting document, which is useful for the proposal development and uh, to compile together. And there was also a preliminary stage to draft the proposal and also distributing and assigning various sections. That's TWGs for uh, three pillars, workforce, surveillance, and lab. And there were the final stakeholders um, sitting together that's out of Addis to uh, for the purpose of fully concentration of all the team to come together and develop one proposal. Next slide, please. 
Then there was a final review and also fine tuning by uh, selected personnel from the team. And also finally the proposal uh, submitted before the deadline by the covering letter signed by Her Excellency the Minister with at a concert team lead of the at national level, uh, Minister of Health and also Minister of Agriculture and other partners also uh, engaged and shown the commitment. So this proposal was also developed uh, the using the roadmap for the EPR flagship initiative. Uh, next slide, please. So the roadmap for the, the EPR flagship initiative was developed in 2022 during the EPR flagship initiative scoping mission. This was a flagship initiative for uh, selected Afro countries, Africa regional countries. So Ethiopia is one of those countries. So we were uh, do the scoping mission. And also this plan also harmonized with the national action plan for health security, which is a multi-sectoral plan and also reviewed at level of through the systematic brainstorming sessions and also having uh, taking that document as a official document to uh, serve as a tool for uh, and also reference for resource mobilization and including the fund. This is also one of the, the enabling document for us to for the pandemic fund. Next slide, please. So the APR flagship initiative, how it is aligned, the, it's also focused on the three pillars, workforce, surveillance, and lab. So it's everything is aligned and we use that proposal again uh, for to leverage the the priority the priority diseases and which is not priority activities which is not funded by other sources. Next slide, please. So, uh, as this is a key the the experience sharing platform. So, what are the key winning pool uh, pointers? So, the, one of the key the first key point as uh, Dr. Praia already clearly said, it's the commitment and the political will of the government and the UN agencies. From for Ethiopian case, because the Minister of Agriculture, the Minister himself, and the Minister of Health, the Minister Health Serve, Environment, National Disaster Risk Management Commission, uh, and also it is entities, agency commissions also engaged, and the uh, UN agencies, WHO, UNICEF, and the FAO country representatives also shown a clear commitment by showing even for co-financing again. And also harmonizing all uh, the uh, proposals, especially the around 70 proposals by various sectors and individuals, academic institutions came together as a one proposal and agencies into uh, Ethiopian proposal. And it's also a multi-sectoral and one health approach, as I said earlier. So all sectors are engaged, especially who have a stake on the health and animal health and environment. And also the One Health Steering Committee, also part of uh, this uh, proposal development. The stakeholders from various government sectors, UN agencies, academic institutions, NGOs are coming together to work one Ethiopian team. This is also evidence during the proposal development. The use of EPR flagship initiative, content and innovative and during uh, compiling roadmap, also one of the lessons that needs to be shared for others. Please, next one, next slide. Yeah, and the other important point is the availability of the existing multi-sectoral working reference document, like National Action Plan for Health Security, which is done following the JE, and also the Ethiopian the United Nations Sustainable Development Framework 2020 uh, to 2025, and the Health Sector Transformation Plan, two, that is the Ethiopian Strategic uh, Health Sector uh, Transformation Plan, and the SPAR Self-Party uh, Assessment uh, and reporting, it's every year that Ethiopia are done and have a report, we use that report as well, JE report, and also performance of the vet veterinary service from uh, animal health side, and the African regional strategy for health security and uh, emergencies, and GIPS, and the Ethiopian Public Health Institute's uh, uh, 10 years of strategic plan also used. Uh, as a reference document. So those documents, availability of existing document and alignment and communication and coordination are helped us a lot to uh, win this proposal. Yeah. So uh, I think this is a final slide. Uh, thank you so much. And I'm also available to answer any question. And also we are also ready to learn from everyone as well. Many thanks. Back to Great. you, Dr. Mina. 
Yeah, thanks so much, Ashley. That was really, really informative. And uh, I think everybody had a lot to learn from you. So we will now go to some questions and answers. Prior to today's session, we um, did collect some questions that people had in advance. So we'll go ahead and answer those. We'll try to answer some from the Q&A function here as well. And the ones that we're not able to get to today, we'll try to provide through an FAQ form following today's session. So the first question I have is for Scott. Um, Scott, individuals would like to know what are the other sources for pandemic preparedness financing that countries should consider beyond the pandemic fund? Thanks, Mindy. So, I mean, the, the key sources, I guess, beyond the pandemic fund are really, well, they're actually within the pandemic fund. They're the other implementing entities within the pandemic fund. So in the pandemic fund, we've got um, the UN organizations such as the World Health Organization, FAO, UNICEF. But we also have a lot of financing institutions such as the World Bank, um, the Islamic Development Bank, European Investment Bank, Asian Development Bank, African Development Bank, um, Inter-American Development Bank. And then there's also some specialized financing institutions such as Gavi, SEPI, the Global Fund, um, IFC, uh, amongst some others. So what we're trying to do is work across the different implementing entities and with countries to look at what are the types of investments needed in preparedness. And some of those investments are going to be sort of, you know, startup costs and things that would be appropriate to a grant. But some of those costs could be broader and looking at the broader investments, say, for example, in infrastructure or setting up systems, um, which could come from some of those other types of uh, multilateral uh, financial institutions. Uh, another key element, and this is part of the pandemic fund application form as well, is obviously domestic financing, because um, beyond that kind of grant financing to set up and start up and do capacity building and the, 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 the concessional loan financing for the broader sort of investments, there also needs to be some type of sustainability in terms of, for example, staffing costs and operational costs. So there we really need to start to also look in at the domestic financing and seeing where the sustainability is. And so the idea is to try and put together these different financing sources over the priorities that the countries have identified to see if we can put a good financial package together. In addition to that, in some countries, there will be specific um, bilateral uh, funding arrangements, say, for example, with USAID or with FCDO. And to the extent that we can also bring some of those bilateral partners in um, uh, to look at the different parts that they could invest in, uh, this is really where we're hoping to package these investments together to get sustainable financing over. Great, thanks, Scott. And maybe just a quick uh, follow-up question. So um, what are your recommendations uh, or what can a national a nation do to um, sustain national financing for pandemic preparedness and response? Oh, that's a, that's a really tough question. I mean, it really depends on different countries. have got different financial situations. Um, we've certainly found in health that not just discussing the financing needs at the Ministry of Health level, but to some extent also then being able to discuss these critical needs at the Ministry of Finance level has been a really critical game changer on the health side to start to look at sustainable financing. So I think one of the things we need to do at country level is not just have these discussions on priorities within health, but to build that kind of more multi-sectoral uh, cabinet level discussions, also bringing in other sectors like the agricultural sector, the environment sector, usually at the prime minister's level um, to sort of say these are really critical kind of investments, not just for health systems, but actually for national security. So when we've been able to start to make the link between pandemic preparedness and health security, you, you, we've been able to sort of um, convey the needs of financing in a different way in terms of um, how they're really a good investment for the country and get a return on investment. So I think putting together that kind of higher level, cabinet level discussion around the pandemic preparedness needs is a really critical way to getting um, the importance of this higher up in the national agenda and securing that financing. Great, 
Thanks, Scott. Um, we have another question. I think this one's going to go to you, Catherine. Um, must the proposal be multi-sectoral? And then when it says multi-sectoral versus One Health, what's the difference? Uh, what's the common area? What are your recommendations here? Thank you, Mindy. So our pro proposal, so the pandemic fund was set up to be a kind of this joint effort that brings together a lot of different um, sectors and ministries. So we are requiring that applicants um, procure a letter of endorsement from both the Ministry of Health and the Ministry of Finance at the very least. So in that respect, there does have to be some multi-sectoral dialogue. One Health um, is about bringing together kind of the animal, the animal health side um, into the proposal. So we've seen a lot of successful proposals that also bring in departments of livestock, um, uh, agriculture, um, the Ethiopia uh, project is a is a great example of that. So um, you know we we shouldn't we want to see really like lots of different partners, stakeholders, ministries coming together and working to try to solve a problem um, together. So that that's kind of what we mean by that. Okay, great. Thanks. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, the next question it keeps coming up um, to get a little bit more advice from you, um, Ashalu, about um, just generally what should people keep in mind as they're developing their pandemic fund proposal? And then specifically, um, maybe a bit more detail on your experience or for the inclusion of CSOs and NGOs as partners, um, if you could share that experience. Thanks. Thank you so much. Uh, yes, uh, we we recommend and we also um, use this experience for us as well for for the future. Uh, you know, while we're developing the the proposal for the pandemic fund, it's uh, having a multi-sectoral coordination is a key. When we say multi-sectoral coordination, I saw one of the questions also from the the, the attendees that uh, Minister of Finance also one of the sector, a key sector for especially for co-financing. And from our case, Minister of Health are committed to put 1.6 million USD as a co-financing because Minister of Health uh, as a government entity doesn't uh, put any finance without the knowledge of Minister of Finance. Now, Minister of Finance also gave us a clear support letter, uh, which is attached for the pro our proposal from Ministry of Finance side to, to engage themselves for the, the, the sustainability, again, for the uh, collaboration to work together. So multi-sectoral coordination, having Minister of Agriculture, Environment, National Disaster Risk Management, commissions that's helped a lot. So we always consider them to engage because health is not only with the Minister of Health. So other sectors are uh, also key. And One Health, it's also a key, uh, plays a key role because uh, the animal, human animal interface, uh, environment interface are a key for any uh, pandemic. So for that, we use our existing platform that we have a national One Health Steering Committee that is um, from Minister of Health, uh, Minister of Agriculture, and uh, Environment, uh, from also Wildlife as well, and uh, DRM and other partners also work together. So we also advise to engage the One Health, uh, if you have a One Health Steering Committee or something, One Health platform or you, from your country, it's good also engage that one. The other key issues is also uh, prioritizing the activities. You know, when I say prioritizing the activities, so, you know, most of the activities may have a funds. So if you work on the prioritization and identifying the key areas, which is not be funded in order to avoid duplication and create synergies for um, uh, implementation. So for this, uh, we use our national action plan for health security, which is in the multi-sectoral uh, plan. And also uh, priority, priority activities are there, which is not funded and we know which activities need to be uh, aligned with this. So having the priority activities, especially NAPs, if you have, that's also very important. The other key important, uh, as uh, already Dr. Kathleen and others already explained about the co-funding and co-financing. That's also one of the key areas to leverage and to get uh, resources, more resources to support our pandemic fund preparedness and response activities in country. And then, then the... 
the final point is also related with uh, uh, how to engage and how the engagement of thesos and also uh, national uh, NGOs. So that is a very important point, and also it is a critical. So we engage uh, the CSOs, the international NGOs, depending on their ex previous experience. They were working with the WHO and the UNICEF, uh, FAO, and again uh, with the Ethiopian Minister of Health. So we know them with working with the surveillance, with the lab, and also the workforce. So we identified them earlier, and they was also having interest. They were submitting the proposal ahead of us uh, separately. Then we approach them through Minister of Health, we approach them and we engage them during the proposal writing. And now for the implementation, we are engaging those uh, strong partners to work with uh, us to implement the, 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 not only even, not only the CSOs, we engage the academic institutions to collaborate, to work on some research and uh, capacity building activities. So depending on the priority activities and their previous experience, we engage them, we invite them, and they show us their expression of interest, and then we engage and we collaborate together. So I think I answer uh, some of the question. If it's still uh, not clear, and if you need uh, more, I will be also uh, uh, with you too. Yeah, thanks yeah, a lot. Thanks so much. Very, yeah. very helpful and very detailed. Thank you very much. Yep. Um, next, we'll go to the, our colleagues at the Pandemic Fund. Um, we have one sort of general question, one more specific question. Um, so I'll go to Priya. Uh, do you have a playbook for countries on how to organize themselves to work on a proposal? I think Catherine wants you to take that one. So Catherine, why don't you take the playbook one and I'll take... Uh, the ones around the Africa CDC. Okay, we'll go to that next. So Catherine, please. Um, we have we don't have uh, an exact playbook uh, right now, but we are going to be running these information sessions to help you. Um, these webinars uh, run by uh, WHO will be very, um, uh, have, they were very helpful to developing proposals um, in the last round. And I think um, one of the things that we're looking at doing is is um, putting together some lessons learned and some community of learnings with the different, um, uh, you know, pro successful proposal um, applicants and implementing entities. And so we will be uh, publishing more kind of learnings and guidance in the future. But for now, I would say these um, this webinar series and also our own. Um, information session uh, tomorrow would be kind of the first, the first uh, uh, area that you could go to for for support. Okay. And so maybe if I can just add to that, we have. Uh, I'd also like to draw your attention to our newly launched website, uh, pandemicfund.org, which has actually um, summaries of all the nineteen projects that were uh, supported under the first call for proposals, and I think that would be also a useful resource for all of you because uh, you you'll get a sense of uh, uh, you know what those projects look like, and uh, obviously those were really the best ones um, that uh, uh, that were selected out of a, a very large number of over a hundred uh, projects. Um, so 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 please do have a look, and uh, also encourage you to provide any feedback on that and reach out to the pandemic fund secretariat and as Catherine said you know we are very much focused on learning and uh, we will um, try to share uh, as many resources as we can based on lessons from the first and the second call in terms of you know what makes a successful proposal very quickly there were a lot of questions around the Africa CDC so I just want to to share with everyone that uh, you know as um, as was mentioned uh Initially, uh, when the pandemic fund was put together, and again, you know, we really wanted to get this initiative up and running so that, you know, financing could, could flow as soon as possible to meet critical country and regional needs. So when it was established in 2022, we uh, had a, a set of 13 initially accredited implementing entities. Uh, and once again, uh, you know, those were uh, the WHO, FAO, UNICEF, World Bank, IFC, African Development Bank, Inter-American Development Bank, um, EIB, uh, and a couple of other regional banks, Asian Development Bank and AIIB. And then there was Global Fund, Gavi, and SEPI. So those were the 13 initial 
implementing entities and they were selected because they were active in the space, but also because they had uh, served as implementing entities for other World Bank financial intermediary funds. So we didn't have to go through, you know, a, a process to, to, to get them accredited. But uh, from the very beginning, we've been committed to, uh, to broadening that group of implementing entities. And one of the ones that has expressed strong interest is the African, uh, is the, is, is the Africa CDC. And so right now, as we speak, uh, we're going through a process, an independent accreditation process. Uh, there's an independent panel of subject matter experts uh, that has looked at uh, proposals that have come in uh, over a dozen uh, implementing uh, potential uh, implementing entities have expressed interest. And one of them is the Africa CDC. So um, very soon uh, we'll be able to share the outcome of that uh, accreditation process. Uh, uh, and we're hoping to be able to do that uh, before the end of April. Um, so please stay tuned. And our goal is to, um, to be inclusive and have, uh, you know, all the um, uh, sort of qualified, uh, technically qualified uh, entities come in to serve as, as, as implementing partners. Thank you so much. Great, thanks a lot, Priya, and I'll and I'll anticipate that my colleagues will share some of the links that you just mentioned um, from the pandemic fund in the in the chat here today. Um, so I see that Scott and and also Ashulu have their hands up. I'll go to you and maybe ask you just for some closing comments given the time, and then we'll share a couple of resources at the end as well. Go ahead, Scott. Thanks. Yeah, thanks a lot. I just wanted to come in on uh, actually both uh, questions. One in terms of a playbook, and as Catherine rightly said, the the forthcoming webinar series actually is a bit of a playbook of actually how to go about developing a pandemic fund application, which um, was pretty helpful, I think, to quite a number of countries last year. And at a high level, um, the playbook is you know meet together, you know form some type of a multi-sectoral committee inclusive of different partners and stakeholders. That's one key part. Um, review the existing assessments and plans and priorities within the country already. We don't have to redo that. A lot of, as, as was said in Ethiopia, a lot of these assessments are already done both on the human health side, on the animal health side, the national action plans are there. Decide on the priorities. And then I think the big part of work is actually then thinking through what are the activities What's the costing and requirements for those activities? And then how do I work across different implementing entities, different partners to work out who's going to do what of that of, the, of that implementation? And then the other big piece of this, as I said before, is then looking at, okay, what are the national budgets that are actually going to sustainably support this? So in the series that we do, we, we go through this step by step by step. Obviously, that's going to be a, a different in every country, but it will be a sort of a playbook of actually how do you go about doing this complex process. On the Africa CDC, um, you know, beyond what Priya said in terms of Africa CDC applying to become an implement against the uh, WHO has, uh, through the Africa Regional Office, has done a lot of work with Africa CDC to join up um, in a unified process in supporting countries to do both single country proposals, but more importantly, um, both multi-country proposals and regional proposals. So there's a whole process going on right now through the Africa Union and with the Africa CDC of writing to countries to say where they'd be interested, which topics they'd be interested to come together on. And we've got a team in Nairobi that's actually working uh, to work with countries to help pull these multi-country proposals together. And this is all part of a joint initiative between WHO and Africa CDC under the Joint Action Plan for Emergency Preparedness for the African Continent. Um, so we've worked out a way this year to work very, very closely with Africa CDC in coordination in supporting countries on the African, co on the African continent to develop their proposals. So that's been a big step from last year. Um, just in closing, um, you know, we're really, really, really thankful of everybody's time today. Uh, really thankful of all the efforts and energies that you're going to have to make to get these proposals over the line. We, we're fully aware of just how big a lift that is. And, and we really, what we're here to do is to support you in the best way we can, either through the training, if we want more webinars and questions and answers, we're happy to do that. Uh, we're setting up support teams through our regional offices. As I said, we've got a big team 
uh, down in Nairobi, ready to support countries. Um, and we're coordinating across all the different implementing entities. So at least when we're coming to you, hopefully it's done in a coordinated way and not making your life more difficult. So thanks again. And um, we're really looking forward to working with you on these proposals. Great. Thanks a lot, Scott. Uh, Ashley, quickly. Yes, thank you so much. Actually, thank you, uh, Scott. You already raised. Uh, I was uh, wanted to raise the Egypt Secretariat uh, related activities because the, the Africa WHO Afro, EMRO, and Africa CDC are working together, and we were also there to share our experience. And we also encourage countries, uh, especially in Africa, to work um, as a multi-country and for regional uh, proposals to work together and align the activities. Uh, it's already the, the grouping of our countries for multi-country uh, proposal is already done. I think uh, most of the countries, they know now they group. So I think I encourage again to work together. Even if they are applying for a single country proposal, it is still good to use the support from the, um, the Africa CDC, uh, WHO from the EMRO, from uh, GIP Secretary, that will help the African uh, working together and that's uh, cross-country, uh, cross-border communication and coordination collaboration. Thank you so much once again. Great, thanks for sharing your experience. Um, I'll quickly go to um, Priya and to Catherine for some closing remarks, but just want to draw your attention to the upcoming schedule for the WHO support um, webinar schedule or webinar series around the pandemic fund preparedness. Um, my colleagues will be sharing the links, I think, in the chat with you so you can see what's coming up in the future. You can see the, 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 the progression. Um, these are meant to be extremely practical, really helping countries and multi-countries to kind of get through the, the, the proposal writing process. You'll see that the week of um, April 8th, uh, it's specifically in the 9th through the 12th, we have dedicated technical sessions around the different technical areas for the pandemic fund. So with that, just for a quick uh, wrap up, I'll go to Priya, then Catherine. Thank you so much, Mindy. And uh, just wanted to add uh, thank you all for your interest uh, in the pandemic fund. Um, we're here, uh, my colleagues and uh, and I at the Secretariat uh, are here to um, to help and uh, answer any questions and uh, guide um, uh, you know and work with all of you uh, to make the uh, the second call for proposals a, a success. Uh, and um, you know it's really wonderful to see so much interest and energy uh, around this. So uh, thank you again and. Uh, uh, please feel free to reach out. Uh, Catherine, you want to say something to add to that? Thank you, Priya. Just to reiterate that, um, you know, we have a pandemic fund. It's a pan pandemic fund CFP uh, mailbox. It's it will it's on the slides. Um, send us an email at that address. Um, it's myself and one other colleague behind it. We strive to get answers back to you very quickly. So if you have any questions about your eligibility, about anything at all, feel free to send us an email and, and we will uh, try to try to help you as best we can. Great, thanks so much. And you can also see additional support from uh, WHO. If you have any additional questions, please feel free to email wheSPP at who.int. I'll repeat that, <laughs> WHESPP at WHO. Dot int. Please just take a moment um, and scan the QR code and give us some feedback on how we can improve throughout this uh, webinar series to assist you in your proposal writing. Um, and with that, um, we'll also promise to uh, send the PowerPoint slides, the frequently asked questions during today's session, because unfortunately we didn't get to many of the questions, the various links and tools that can assist you through the process. Um, we'll also have a recording of this webinar that we'll upload to YouTube and we'll send you that link as well for you to share with your colleagues. Um, thank you very much, Scott, Catherine, Priya, and Ashalu. Thank you so much for your time today. And thank you to those who participated.